Um, today's conference is a review of our work, as I've said, and um, in particular, uh, the tenure case at the ICC. And last year, I um, addressed you all about tenure in the ICC, its background, um, how it got there. And this year, we're going to look at the procedures so that those of you who may not have had experience of a case at the International Criminal Court and want to know how it all fits together and what shape it takes, um, we're going to take you through our journey um, of the last year um, since the occasion when uh, the case moved from an investigation into being uh, the summons of Uhuru Kenyatta, the one on the right hand side, his father Joe Mo was the first president of Kenya, the deputy prime minister, he is the um, minister of finance uh, and the leader of the Kanu party, uh, and what journey he's had to go on and what the process we've been through uh, in these proceedings where we now await the result of the confirmation hearing, which, if you like, is our committal procedure, um, but done in an international form for these particular cases. Um, this case concerns the investigation of the tenure situation and its post-election violence by the prosecutor that Luis Marino Ocampo from Argentina and his investigation into the post-election violence of Kenya in December 2007 to the end of February 2008. And he used a power that he has under the Treaty of Rome, which is the founding statute of the International Criminal Court, to apply under Article 15 to the court for permission to investigate the post-election violence. On the 26th of November 2009, uh, because he is investigating this himself, he's not like an ordinary policeman or prosecutor who can just do that. There is a restraining mechanism upon him that requires him to request for authorization of an investigation pursuant to Article 15. And he filed 39 annexes of evidence with the pretrial chamber to get their permission to enable him to conduct this investigation. We'll show a short video clip of the kind of activity that was going on that has caused um, this power to be enacted by him. The violence in Kenya is probably going to spread quite fast. This is Naibasha, about 100 kilometers west of Nairobi. It is the latest to be hit by the ethnic violence group in this country. Armed groups from a revenge mission attack his house, the non-interim leader, opposition leader, while a dangerous community. The occupants and some of their neighbors have sought refuge inside from the violent youth. They now lie there, their bodies still burning. Inside the town, police and this dance and running buckles, a soldier struggled to remove the roadblock. There was little traffic on the Nairobi Naivasha Highway, one of the country's major arteries. The few vehicles flying the road were stopped and searched for members of some ethnic community. <laughs> Using machetes and other crude weapons, the youth meted out brutal violence and everyone they found. There are now fears of a cycle of attack and revenge is already beyond the control of the security. The uh, Basha featured in that clip is one of the uh, places that we're concerned with in our charges at the ICC. Two places, Nabasha and Nakuru. Um, having considered the uh, prosecutor's uh, application, pre-trial chamber that has been appointed by the ICC to deal with this issue as a preliminary issue, um, 
found that the evidence submitted uh, supported a reasonable base to believe that crimes against humanity had been perpetrated upon the civilian population of Kenya. And that's the first stage test then that kicks off the procedure that then brings a case to the ICC. The crimes that they considered were murder, rape, uh, sexual violence, deportation, uh, and forcible transfer and other inhumane acts. Now the Kenya proceedings have taken two sides. There is Kenya one, which involves the uh, perhaps lure ODM uh, side of the country, and there's Kenya two, which involves the PNU, the um, Kikuyus, the other peoples, and these uh, two sets of uh, the uh, political divide, if you like, have three people now as suspects in relation to uh, what took place in the uh, post-election violence. So in that film it mentioned there one community, there is in fact another procedure dealing with um, the other community. But at this stage, there's been no identification. It's simply uh, an investigation. But uh, 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 an issue was thrown up immediately in relation to this investigation in respect to crimes against humanity. Uh, the pretrial chamber consists of three judges, uh, one from Italy, one from Bulgaria, and then one from Germany. The German judge, Judge Kohl, um, having reviewed the prosecutor's evidence, dissented about the reasonable basis to believe because he found that the attack against the civilian population was not pursuant or in furtherance to a, a, a state or organizational policy. The prosecutor here was putting this case that it wasn't a state policy uh, uh, violence that had erupted, it was a non-organizational policy that had been behind the violence. Crimes Against Humanity, as um, Bill Shavers will tell you in the next lecture um, this morning, has a particular definition, and he found, looking at it, that this was more akin to random violence or violence organized at a lower level but did not have behind it the organizational policy which is a particular structure, hierarchy, sanctioning mechanism of those taking part, the ability to command if you like or issue orders and he found that what he was looking at was something more akin to an outbreak of violence parts organized, but not having the organizational policy that should be required to produce a case of sufficient seriousness at the International Criminal Court. Um, at this stage, the prosecutor had merely announced an investigation. It wasn't an investigation in relation to particular people. For instance, we have the Gaddafi situation where that was expressly an investigation into Mahmoud Gaddafi, his family, and other leaders. This was a general investigation into the situation in Kenya. And so the leading politicians, uh, those in positions of uh, uh, authority within the police, within the armed forces, didn't know if they were a suspect or not. Kofi Annan had provided a list of people to a commission of inquiry in which he had just submitted 20 names of people he thought might be suspects. No one in the uh, Kenyan elite, if you like, knew if they were under investigation or not. And so during that period, various 
people began to get nervous that they might be a suspect. There were rumors flying around the press. There was information that could be found within blogs, within commissions uh, of inquiry. And, and a number of these uh, people um, were, were getting agitated because they were dissatisfied with the quality of the investigation that they could see was being carried out in Kenya. And uh, one of those uh, people who believed he might be a suspect, William Ruto, uh, decided to go to The Hague and make a, a, a representation that he should have um, a representation to an amicus curiae um, to say uh, what his position was if he was being uh, put forward to the court eventually as a suspect, why he should not be a suspect and subject to further proceedings. What happened was that the prosecutor didn't carry out any suspect interview. He merely put together a file without putting any allegations to particular individuals and then collecting this evidence largely from pre-existing sources rather than investigating the case itself. <coughs> and this caused a great deal of unease as to what the proper duty of the prosecutor should be. So Ruto, who was one of the ODN politicians for that election, uh, decided to challenge that. Um, the court found that there was no legal basis for him to make these representations uh, because uh, there had been nothing that had identified him. He wasn't a person within the proceedings. He wasn't uh, named as a victim or anything like that. But there was nothing at all uh, that entitled him as an individual to present his own evidence uh, to the court and um, object or try and counter the prosecution's file that they were assembling. The court said, we, we are unable to control this investigation. It's a matter of the prosecutor. All we can do is judge the product of the investigation and whether it gets to the sufficient standard to enable the case to go forward and uh, he was denied making representation. Now, this kind of situation is something that you will frequently come across. We were under pressure from Uhuru Kenyatta and his advisors to do something, do something. And I said, we have absolutely no standing to do anything. All you'll do is bring yourself to their attention, that the press will report it as though you've got a guilty conscience and you feel there should be something, just keep calm and, and let the procedure go on. Maybe you're not identified, it, it, it may be um, that other people are. And so you get this kind of pressure in these cases, and I think the Ruto application was, was very ill-advised. <laughs> And what you have to do, because when you're handling them as the outside expert, you're actually dealing with all the people who advise and gather around these leaders, who've known them for a long while, have great influence, so if you like part of the team, you're coming in as an outsider and telling them how it's going to be, and people don't like that. They think, oh, you're not fighting the case. But you have to stand absolutely resolute because eventually when you do get into court, uh, the court needs to respect you as a lawyer and respect the way you've handled these proceedings. And I think the Ruto team took an utterly ill-advised step uh, in what they did. Fortunately, uh, Kenyatta agreed. Um, moving on now, we've had the investigation. Uh, Ruto's been denied his say in it and the papers uh, are uh, submitted uh, to the court and the court then has to make a decision 
um, how to deal with the evidence, whether there are reasonable grounds to believe that the person identified, um, some may be publicly, others may be secretly. Uh, it depends how the prosecutor uh, wants to uh, present this to the international world. Uh, whether such persons uh, have committed the crimes alleged which are within the jurisdiction of the court, and then whether a summons to tell them to attend proceedings uh, in The Hague is sufficient, or whether an arrest warrant should be issued. And an international arrest warrant uh, is issued and distributed through all the states of the world and is a means of compulsion. John Kame will be addressing you about enforcement procedures at the ITC uh, later on uh, this afternoon. Um, in this case, uh, having received the prosecutor's <coughs> file, uh, the chamber uh, found that there are reasonable grounds to believe uh, that during the period cited, um, the Mungiti criminal organization carried out an attack against the non Kikuyu population and those perceived uh, as being uh, members of a rival political party. Um, so having considered this file, come to that conclusion, uh, what did Judge Call do? Because he was against these grounds and when the original application was made uh, for the investigation, well, he maintained his position. Um, his position was, no, this case should not go further. So we have a proceedings now that is going through the pretrial stage in which two of the judges are for it advancing and one against. And in relation to the issuance of the summonses, um, that was the position uh, that continued because Judge Call uh, was dissenting. Um, having decided to issue arrest warrants, uh, not issue arrest warrants, uh, summonses instead of arrest warrants, then it becomes a case of a, a test, if you like, whether the suspect is going to cooperate with the court or not. In relation to the Gaddafis, it's obvious they're not. That's arrest warrant territory. Um, also, um, uh, the President of Sudan, um, again, arrest warrant territory. Uh, but here, the court found that there were no grounds to suspect that uh, Kenyatta wouldn't cooperate with the court and indeed the others. There have been many public statements and uh, things said in the press, uh, but he'd appointed lawyers. Um, we were engaged with the court. We filed powers of attorney. And so the court was prepared to allow him under his own steam to come to the Hague and be the subject of the proceedings as a result of a summons rather than an arrest warrant which would have put him in custody. And in terms of his political position and his status, obviously being a, a, a matter of considerable concern. So uh, what happens here is that what's called an initial appearance is arranged at the ICC in The Hague. Uh, and that was on the 8th of <coughs> April of uh, 2011 then, and at those proceedings, individuals confirm their identity. Um, this has also taken place outside court. The court goes to great lengths to ensure they understand their rights, that they understand the language of the court, that they know their rights, that, uh, that, that they have to be informed of the proceedings, that they understand why they are there. A very elaborate uh, procedure uh, and as his attorney I have to sign those documents as well and you do it in a meeting in advance. So done very much in a sort of committee context but done in a very civilized way 
and not a rough handling of the suspect. Um, we have a short video uh, clip here, and we'll play that. Thank you. The same uh, question I would pose to Mr. Kenyatta. Yes, I have been informed, but I have been informed through um, some press release from the prosecutor's office, and uh, then subsequently brought and given the charges through official means. But that was the first time I got to hear that I was the first time before this court. But still, the registrar. The registrar did eventually after that. Yes, yes. This, was, this was the order that the chamber took. Yes. And uh, assigned the registrar with the task. And as far as the report that I have received today, conference, it was been informed, and there is a document signed by you, but I wanted to hear from you. It was delivered. Thank you, Mr. Kenya. Right. His beef was that he first of all heard about it through the press, and then the thing goes into action. <laughs> Um, and the point he wanted to get over there as well, um, and, and that's lurking in the background. No one's ever asked me about any of these allegations in these charges on this piece of paper that I'm being asked to come before your court for the initial appearance to deal with. No one's ever asked me whether they're true, whether they're false, and what the background is. Um, so the initial appearance takes place. Uh, one match you'd like to know, you saw me there in the uh, <coughs> traditional wig. After those proceedings, Judge Trendus Palova said and, and asked the English bar not to wear their wigs in her court and, and, and to remove them so we just had to wear our ordinary costume. Having been told by other officials before the proceeding, bring your wig and gown and wear them. So a young court grappling, if I may say so, with its identity. Uh, and trying to um, um, establish, if you like, um, uh, a, a, a cohesive look, maybe. But there is actually no international bar. And someone like her, who's more of a technocrat, who not really understand these issues, there isn't an international bar. There's national bars, and from your national bar, you appear in an international court. Let's look at some further issues now. Uh, prior to the confirmation hearing um, that we had to deal with. Um, now we have this position whereby Kenyatta, member of the government, deputy prime minister, is on charges at the ICC. Um, the chief uh, secretary to the president, uh, Francis Muthara, otherwise called the ambassador, also subject to charges. Chief of the Police, uh, General Ali, subject to charges. And the defence teams <laughs> gradually um, sussing each other out, uh, combining together, uh, trying to uh, find if there's going to be any problems in the way we advance and handle our, our cases, um, had several meetings to discuss evidence and how we were going to go about our, our business. Kenya one, its own separate structure, the other side uh, having their own meetings as well. The government of Kenya, which of course has not prosecuted any senior people in relation to the post-election violence, but only prosecuted perpetrators and people at a low level organization level, now faces a, a crisis because there are senior members involved with the political structure of Kenya before the ICC. Kenya is a state party of, of the ICC and Kenya is now finding this whole experience very, very embarrassing. The reason why it arrived at the ICC was because Kenya had failed to do anything in the first place. So, belatedly, um, they try and take measures to intervene. As a postscript here, about uh, a year before um, Ocampo uh, sought permission for his investigation, uh, the Attorney General of Kenya 
and its UN ambassador came to see Julian and myself in The Hague for some advice. Uh, and we advised, you better get your act together and sort yourself out and start doing something about this, because it will otherwise come up and, and bite you from behind. Well, he did nothing, absolutely nothing, uh, and just let it you get, melt, move around in the usual swim of things. Jill wrote, in fact, an 80-page opinion on the matter for them, uh, and I've asked him since where that went to, and he, he still can't tell me where it is. It's probably still stuffed in his drawer or, or, or something. Anyway, crisis now, and Attorney General is being aimed through the exit, and a new Attorney General uh, to come in. Kenya wanted to intervene and say, we, we will deal with this problem. We do not want it to go further. Um, we will prosecute. Uh, we are investigating. But in fact, have put forward uh, a, a, a load of materials that were very much in the hope rather than expectation and, and talk about what they were going to do. Well, the issue now becomes how relevant is that? The report has uh, a case before it. Um, the case is there because nothing was done. Can a state intervene and say, we will take that case over? The interesting thing was, in all the materials filed by the government of Kenya, who were represented by Sir Geoffrey Nice QC, uh, an old adversary, uh, and uh, Rodney Dixon, was uh, no mention of any of the six accused who were on trial at the ICC. So it, it was utterly doomed to failure, uh, this kind of application. But it was done by the government, the government law officers, to make them look as though they were doing something uh, and to make them look good. In fact, we, we advised against it. Uh, Karen Khan, who represents Ambassador Mufara, and myself tried to stop it, saying this this looks bad, what will happen is uh, it, it will look as though um, you're trying to mislead the court, which will be bad for our image if we want the court to accept the good intentions and bona fides of Kenya. How can we do that if the court finds against you in relation to this particular application that you've done nothing about it and you're trying to um, mislead the court in relation to investigation and steps? Um, to be taken. The other defence teams, though, three in the other one, and indeed General Ali's team, were, were against Khan and myself in relation to this, and, and so we had a different uh, of opinion. And eventually, the majority uh, won the day, and the government continued uh, its measures, uh, all of which ended in failure. They went up to the appeals chamber, ended in failure there. And the problem now for us is that there is a loss of trust between the ICC and one of its state parties, Kenya, which then makes it very, very difficult for us to rely upon interventions from the Kenyan government in the future over witness protection measures, over other issues, if there is no good, um, good faith basis for the relationship between the state party and the court. Um, at the initial um, appearance, uh, the prosecution requested uh, extra conditions to be imposed on the um, suspects. And they're only suspects at this stage. So we're still dealing with only investigation, and there's been no confirmation of charges. Uh, and th they started trying to push the boat out a bit uh, and get details from us about our assets, um, all, all sorts of other details which they had not sought before. A and the court said, well, very similar to this country, what's the change in circumstances here? These people have come voluntarily, they've caused us no trouble, they've got attorneys, um, and in case, this, this case is going ahead satisfactorily, and rejected the application. <coughs> Uh, and that was very important for us because that showed the court was prepared not to be a cipher of the prosecution. Great feeling because of the close relations between 
prosecution authorities and the courts here, they're in the same building, they only see each other, the defense are rather a more transitory issue, they don't have ongoing relations in the same way with the defense. This kind of issue was very important to the morale uh, of the suspect. But we then had a further issue that, that cropped up, and that was the place of the proceedings. Power to the ICC to hold these proceedings uh, other, in a place other than uh, the Hague. And the court, um, because of uh, listing problems, um, was uh, keen, I think, to have these proceedings not in the Hague, but either in Arusha, Tanzania, using the Rwanda Tribunal building, um, or even in Nairobi itself. Prosecution, this was something that they were able to excite and use, because they immediately said, oh no, too dangerous, we can't even get witnesses in relation to this case, too dangerous for, for you judges, um, it's got to be in the hay, not there. Our position was for the Kenya to think, go to the Go and have it in Nairobi. You'll be absolutely fine. We travel there regularly. Nothing's going to happen there. Other defense teams were at variance with us over this. They, they wanted it in the head. And from my perspective, I think that was a very, very bad move because you just added to the fact that the prosecution has a, a, a basis for believing that life is too difficult in Kenya for witnesses, that there could be mm -hmm. trouble, and that this matter is no longer, that this matter is it, 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 still potentially alive as a conflict, which it's not, it's been done and dusted and finished. And uh, I think that was a bad move um, and, and tactical error by the defense to go along um, with that. So the decision was made uh, by the court, um, accepting the evidence of the other defense parties uh, and the prosecutor that it would be too dangerous and the risk to security to have proceedings in Nairobi. Um, let's turn now to where all this is going to, uh, the confirmation hearing itself. We've had our investigation, uh, prosecution continue to investigate, we've had our summons issued, we've cooperated, we're given conditional release, we go back to our home country, and now we prepare for the next stage as to whether these charges that are being sought to be put forward by the prosecutor are to be confirmed. And if you like, our old committal, that it's going to be a committal and then go directly into the trial uh, process. Um, uh, the standard here uh, for the sufficiency of the evidence found under Article 61 is that the prosecutor shall support each charge with su sufficient evidence to establish substantial grounds to believe that the person committed the crime charge. Now, previously we've seen the court looking at whether the prosecution has, the prosecutor has reasonable grounds to believe, whether his perspective is correct. We're now shifting to the court judging the evidence for itself rather than the <coughs> reasonableness of the prosecution's uh, ground. And in relation to the evidence that can be brought at the, this stage for the confirmation hearing, um, they may use uh, reports, documents, unsigned statements, uh, signed statements, uh, recorded statement, they don't even have to have live witnesses. It, it's rather like the continental dossier system, so it becomes a file. First thing I learned when I became an international criminal lawyer is you turn these matters back on them, and that's how we operate. I, I don't know anything about the laws of evidence here, and I don't even think about them. I seek reliability and I seek credibility, and I seek to get it to a higher level, but we gather together as much material as possible uh, and don't even think about whether it's admissible or not because the entire dossier uh, goes in. But we, we look to do it in a particular way, 
but we use these rules ourselves for our benefit. At the confirmation hearing, um, you notify which charges you object to, um, all or, 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 or any, um, that you want to challenge the evidence of the prosecution, and, and that you want to present your own evidence. So uh, we took the decision that we would be presenting our own case um, as well. Um, trial chamber then looks at the entirety, the prosecution pot as well as the defence pot. In our committal proceedings, it's the prosecution pot. The old style committal proceedings we had 30 years ago or whatever, the defence were rather more proactive. Um, but not to a, a great extent, <coughs> but here you can be as active as you like and, and present your, your evidence, present witness statements, unless you're going to take a position whereby it's going to go forward, I'm not going to declare anything early on in the game. We had clear instructions here, because in 2012, um, Uhuru Kenyatta has been, if you like, pointed to be one of the candidates for the presidency, that we've got to try and quash and, and stifle these allegations straight away and at the earliest possible opportunity. So we took the position uh, that we were going to <coughs> present a very full dossier uh, on his behalf. Um, court has the power to decline to confirm, can adjourn the proceedings, to allow the prosecutor to get more evidence, can amend charges, um, and uh, the prosecutor can come back at any time with, with further evidence. So it's quite an open-ended procedure uh, you have here. Stakes are high. These are big cases involving big global political issues. Uh, and so uh, there, there is no, uh, if you like, um, curtailing that you might get in a national system out of expediency, the system here is much more expansive because of the high stakes, high profile of the cases, as well as the large number of victims, uh, etc., um, who also have an interest and make filings in relation to the proceeding. Prosecution um, disclosed their, their material. Um, they provided us with their material 30 days before the confirmation hearing um, was set. Um, 15 days after they've disclosed, so 15 days before the confirmation hearing starts, we have to disclose uh, our evidence. All this is uploaded into an electronic system. Um, all of it indexed into a searchable database. Um, it took then, I think, four weeks in the Hague to upload our 600 items of evidence that we had, a large number of video film, as well as media clips, statements, exhibits. Um, so a, a very technical process, and every case has to have um, what Ben is on the Kenyatta case, and that's the case manager who handles the infotech, uh, as well as the liaison between counsel and what we produce uh, with the court uh, and the prosecution. So, we entered our confirmation hearing on the 21st of September to the 5th of October. Um, the proceedings had a structure that the court had devised. Um, all parties get a 30-minute opening. Um, in relation to the prosecution, they then had eight and a half hours to present their evidence. In that time, they could call Viva Voce witnesses, live witnesses, if they wanted to. They declined to do so. The prosecution were not going to expose any of their witnesses uh, to being live. Um, for the defense, we were given uh, only two live witnesses to be called by each accused. Uh, a two hours direct examination, prosecution having a one hour cross, 
and we were allowed 30 minutes re-examination. Um, we had submitted a list of eight names and were given two. The other parties uh, submitted lists of 30 names, 25 names, 16 names, and all got two as well. I actually had no intention of ever calling more than two. I, I was just naming more names to put pressure on the court to try and get more time. Victims' counsel uh, can be given a role in these proceedings. Uh, he can also question in relation to matters that are of concern uh, to the victim. Uh, and then you have 30 minutes for closing um, uh, address. So how do you manage in that time? Well, 30 minutes, you can open a case, you know, and I hate to tell a long-winded counsel about that. I've got much more short-tempered, I think, with those who appear. I'm sitting at the moment three weeks of Croydon and the waffle and the discursion you get, you think, oh, just get on with it. Um, you can do it, and the way we did it was by presenting live evidence of him in the media, um, which got over in a 40-second video clip what would have been five minutes of waffle, and you could see it live, direct evidence. Um, and also, we were attacking the other side who had caused the violence, and uh, so we spent 15 minutes of uh, how they were responsible and we were attempting to diffuse uh, the problem uh, that they had caused. Ben, if you could show um, just a clip of how we did it. Eric of Mosworth plans political consultant. <laughs> Acquainted with engineering to open his election and the election of governor of Africa. Dick Morris was seen as the principal architect of the re-election of President Bill Clinton in 1996. He worked with the little-known United Kingdom Independence Party in the 2004 European elections, helping them to win 12 of Britain's 78 seats in the European Parliament. He was also the campaign consultant to Viktor Yushchenko's presidential campaign in Ukraine in 2004 in the so-called Orange Revolution. The most uh, the world is best known as the Rosie in 1996, a election of the U.S. President Bill Clinton. Morris says the job is purely voluntary and will attract no payments from what he I met with the Dick in New York during the election trip, and I was absolutely thrilled when he said he would be willing to come and help us here. I told him that I would work in his campaign pro bono for free, uh, and I'm going to do that. The man is written to offer sellers on how to run a successful campaign is already achieving confidence. I think we're going to uh, win this election. Morris will be assisted by another consultant, Louis Rivolis. The development coming just to say before the formal presidential nomination is likely to inject a new dimension into the already charged political campaigns where propaganda is already the stock in trade. <laughs> there you are. In that clip, um, we were attacking the cause of the violence, which was not the Kenyatta side of the political divide. The other side, the ODM, uh, we worked out had the initials, stood, uh, those initials stood for Orange Democratic Movement. Um, we have also reminded ourselves that this took place exactly in the same way in the Ukraine in 2005, where an Orange Party, the Orange Democratic Movement, um, had alleged stolen elections and then gone on to the streets for mass action which was exactly what happened in Kenya. And we happened to come across the fact that Dick Morris, who had engineered the Ukrainian ODM election campaign and had come from Clinton's camp, uh, we discovered that he was in Nairobi and Kenya at the same time as their election and had given the same plan to Odinga, who was Kenyatta's rival in the presidential campaign to come. And so we were able to make that and we were able to show the exact evidence. 
press conference, the link to the Ukraine, it's in May. Um, Odinia actually left Nairobi the next day and, and went for a couple of weeks to New York to hide because it had rather exposed him in, in a way that no one had in the sort of discussions about the election, the election violence. So at the same time as doing our opening statement, we were taking out a political opponent um, as well. But it was all very important because Odinga and his side had called for the mass action. Um, we also spent a, a period of time attacking the prosecution's uh, structure of its case. Uh, we divided our uh, presentation of our case in the response to the prosecution eight and a half hours, where we had four. Jill spent two hours attacking the structure of the case, checking all the footnotes, the evidence they were relying upon to actually putting together a profile that significantly challenges the <coughs> substantial grounds to believe test, discovering they were relying on anonymous hearsay, unsigned witness statements, uh, and then um, three witnesses, uh, one of whom had given conflicting stories, and then two more, witnesses 11 and 12, whom we had in fact interviewed uh, had been uh, the subject of giving us an uh, exculpatory account because we were only paying their bus fares to come to our offices for an interview in Nairobi. Um, they tried to blackmail us and extort money from us. We didn't play that game. A and they uh, then went to the prosecution and told a completely different story to them. A and the prosecution bought these two witnesses, if you like. Uh, but looking through what they said, um, we could tell it was our witnesses. So we brought Gary Summers, who sits over there, who has a, an international investigation uh, side to his um, business at the bar, a and I brought him in as an independent person to review our files, take all the messages out of our phones, but put together the profile that we were right. These witnesses, just called 11 and 12, were the people who'd been blackmailing us and we discovered that they were trying to blackmail other witnesses that we had. So the court has before it a very, very interesting um, issue in relation to <coughs> credibility, the purposes of the confirmation hearing. Um, my time is up, my 45 minutes uh, is up. I was going to show you a film about that, um, but um, maybe I will. Can we just show video seven? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Conclusion. Not only did Mr. Summers confirm that the defence had correctly identified the two protected witnesses, but he also made the following startling conclusion. One, it appeared to be the refusal to pay anything other than expenses that led to the disenchantment of prosecution witnesses 11 and 12 with the Uhuru Kenyatta legal team. Two, that both witnesses were knowing and willing parties to an extortion attempt on Uhuru Kenyatta in 2011. And thirdly, that in his opinion, both had attempted to pervert the course of justice by giving a wholly inculpatory account to the prosecutor after having given a wholly exculpatory account to the defence in February of this year. So there we have it. The case against us now is in the scales of justice. The court has really three witnesses against us in relation to quite a big issue. Um, one of those witnesses we've uh, found conflicting statements, etc. Uh, but the other two are actually blackmailers and extortionists, so the court has this toxic dump, largely caused because the prosecutor <coughs> didn't investigate his case properly at all. He <coughs> stuff from Kenya, shoved it before the court, uh, and didn't think he was going to be challenged, uh, uh, and that we would go through every single word, every single piece of paper to check the quality of his case. Thank you very much.